Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the number one lawn bowling podcast in the world. I'm your host, Lucas Caldwell, and today I'm with the boys, Michael and Daryl. Boys, how's it going today? Oh, well, it's pretty good. It's a new year, so that's that's always good. It's uh, starting to warm up in Saskatchewan. We were about minus 40 for about two weeks there, so that was quite enjoyable. Uh, how's it out there for you guys? Chilly. All sorts of fun stuff. Fair enough. What about you, Daryl? How's Daryl? New Year's was uh, was good. It was quiet. I mean, uh, we um, kept it quiet around here. It was nice. Um, didn't get to see family, which was a, kind of a drag. But that's what happens when there's lockdowns and all this uh, other stuff going on. But um, it is what it is. We're all good. Alrighty, guys. Well, I think we got a jam-packed episode today. We got a few things going on, but before we get into it, let's cover some basics, guys. If you haven't already, remember to hit that like button down there. There's a red red subscribe button, and there's a little notification bell. Make sure you tick that so you get all of our notifications anytime anything goes on the page or we go live. Uh, the like button, we appreciate it more than it uh, takes you to click that little button. It's great. Uh, any comments you got for feedback and stuff, don't be afraid to fire those in the bottom or Hit us up anywhere else on social media, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, I think we're even on TikTok now because we're hip. And uh, yeah, I guess we can get right into it, Daryl. Do you want to start us off on our first segment here? Yeah. Um, it, it's a sad note. Um, we we lost um, a legendary bowler um, to Canada uh, recently. And as a show, as a group, we wanted to pay our respects. And um, for those of you that don't know, uh, Ronnie Jones passed away. Um, absolute legend in the sport. Um, multiple time uh, medal winner internationally, Canadian, um, provincially here in Ontario. Um, probably not enough nice things I could say about him. Um, but uh, we do have... Uh, a video to show you it'll go over his accomplishments it's actually his 2011 i believe induction into the london ontario uh, sports hall of fame um luke mike i'm gonna have to ask you to to mute yourselves because your vid audio is connected to the video audio unfortunately um so we'll do that and i will just play that video and when we come back uh we can chat about it One, one of London's, London's most decorated, decorated athletes, athletes when, when it comes, comes to medals and citations. citations. His, His trophy, trophy case is overflowing. He's Ron Jones, Jones one, one of the elite lawn bowlers, bowlers in Canada, and for that matter, in the world. An international star, if you will. Ron, or Ronnie as he's often referred to by the media, has assembled a career record that has ordinary bowlers quaking with envy. Singles, pairs, trebles, or forced competition, he has competed in all forms of these events and it has the hardware to prove it. His dossier has 26 international selections, 7 Canadian championships, 12 Ontario titles, 26 Western Ontario Bulls Association victories, and 12 United States Southeast Division titles. The WOBA recognized Ron's long-standing talents, including being named Bowler of the Tournament seven times by making him a life member during a special presentation last July. The WOBA was established in 1896, and they hold a week-long tournament in London and Woodstock that attracts players from around the world. Ron responded by teaming up with son Kevin to win the Paris title for a third year in a row. His other son Ian is also an accomplished bowler. Born in Liverpool, England, Ron came to Canada in 1952. He has been a member of the Elmwood Club ever since holding down all the executive positions, including being president in 1964 and 65. He was a national umpire from 1976 to 1996 and chairman of Ontario's officiating committee from 1984 through 1987. 
Ronnie is truly an international star and over the years has had 17 personal invitations to compete in competitions in Hong Kong, Australia, England, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales. Among his medal collection are three golds at the Pacific Rim Tournament in Hong Kong and the silver and bronze in the World Championships. Ronnie also chalked up a silver medal in the 1986 Commonwealth Games in Edinburgh. It may seem a bit out of the ordinary to be inducting an 81-year-old into the athlete modern category, but Ron Jones is not an ordinary athlete. He may keep on bowling forever. The London Sports Hall of Fame is pleased to add him to the class of 2011. Nice video clip there of uh, of his accomplishments. Um, uh, he's a special guy. I I came in at the the tail end of of his career, um, meeting him and Bill Becker. I was lucky to have uh, Bill Becker out of my club. Um, I think the the things that I remember about him was just the chance to sit down and and chat. Um, he was such a nice guy, always welcoming. Um, I only got to to chat with him a few times. Um, unfortunately, I played against him a few times in Woba, um, but really, um, I think we've we've lost a, a really good part of our community. And um, Mike, do you have do you have anything to add to that? Pretty much the same as what you're saying there. I came across him a, a few times on the on the green, mostly at Woba. A few years that I was out there, so same type of thing. I think the one time I showed up and I was playing him and I saw a fairly, a fairly old man and I was thinking, oh, this might be a, an easy game. And I think he ended up beating me by about 10 points in a singles match. So it's one of those things where he is uh, quite the prolific bowler. He was a great, great bowler. And then we did have a good chat after the game. So definitely uh, sending our condolences to the Jones family out there. Yeah, personally, I wasn't uh, lucky enough to meet him through my travels that I'm aware of anyways if i did then i apologize but uh, yeah just uh, sending our condolences to the family so yeah uh kevin ian if you're out there listening um we wish you um nothing but the best this year we know uh our condolences and our sympathies go out to you and uh like i said we we lost a special member of our canadian bulls uh, community um i guess so we can we can leave it at that for now Okay. All right, I guess uh, moving forward, did you guys want to go ahead and do uh, some more talking here? Did you want to watch another video? What are you guys thinking? Do you want to do the update on the uh, WBT, which is currently kind of going on as we speak? Right now? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Well, let's, let's jump into that. So uh, World Bulls Tour, uh, World Indoor Championships currently going on at Potter's. So that's awesome i enjoy watching it every single year so it started up uh i believe it would have been early last week there so we had quite a few games to watch over the week uh specifically i think right now there's some mixed pairs games going on over on their channel so uh some people are probably watching that or if you want to jump over to that uh you could definitely take a look at there they have some mixed pairs matches on right now um at this point like results wise there's been quite a few games just sort of in the the singles event so uh, uh canada's own uh, eric was there so he had a pretty respectable showing um against, he played Stuart anderson so i think you believe he was he was in a really close second set and ended up losing a, a tough one there so that was a good showing on his behalf it was a fun match to watch i know i was watching it when i was uh, working that day so i had it on my phone open so that was pretty good um so good showing by eric uh Proud showing, I guess, made us all proud that you you're able to get some pretty good bowls in there in, during that game. Um, beyond that, like the pairs is the only other uh, event that's kind of moved along pretty far at this point. So the pairs final is set uh, that would be going on tomorrow. So that's Mark Dawes and Jamie Chesney versus Stuart Anderson and Darren Burnett. So that game would be tomorrow if you wanted to check that out on the World Bowls Tour channel. Beyond that. Uh, today is the semifinals for the mixed pairs. So I believe right now uh, it's 
Allison Marion and Paul Foster versus Catherine Randall and Robert Paxton. So that game's currently going right now. Um, pretty much the World Bowls tour runs through the end of the week. Uh, so I believe it's next uh, weekend there. They have the finals. Uh, BBC is doing some coverage. So there's different ways you could watch. You could watch for YouTube or if you do have access to BBC, you could check that out as well. And that would be the 22nd and the 23rd or the last two days. So lots of bowls to look forward to over the next few days. Yeah, I uh, just wanted to uh, read the chat there. Uh, David Cohort, friend of the show, says, uh, yeah, Eric did well. Yeah, I give a quick shout out to Eric. Yeah, the young guy did all right. Um, had some pretty good bowls out there. I think it just uh, comes down to uh, a lack of practice and experience on on the blue carpet. Um, and obviously playing against one of the, the indoors best, Stuart Anderson. He had a great second set. Like Mike said, I was uh, a little busy that day, but I was able to watch it while I was not catching any fish on the lake. So Eric provided me with a bit of entertainment there. So yeah, you gotta make sure you guys uh, keep in, keep up with uh, those games. They're fun to watch, uh, especially when there's no bowls going on here in Canada. Um, yeah, I mean, f fun to watch. Always fun to watch. Um, one quick question: What do you guys think about um, the change in attire? Um, I hadn't really heard anything about it, and when I I watched um, them play. Just seeing the, the black shorts right away um, really caught me off guard. And the new shirts are really nice, too. But what do you guys think about that? Uh, I think it's interesting. I mean, uh, it was kind of funny just uh, watching it on Facebook or YouTube, wherever. And you see some of the comments from uh, maybe like the older traditional crowd. I thought it was kind of funny how outraged some people were about uh, different colors. Um, personally, I think it's long overdue. I mean, even just going to black's a, a pretty big change for something like that. Um I don't know. I think uh, dress codes in the sport are interesting. That's all I'm really going to say. If you want my uh, honest take on it, I think I own one pair of white shorts and zero pairs of white pants. So that would explain my take on them switching to black. Uh, so if I ever had that opportunity to play over at Potter's or with the World Bulls Tour, I would have literally had to go purchase myself some whites. So it's something where I think the game has really moved to black specifically is probably the most common color you're going to see out there because it's a very neutral bottom or, and it's honestly the, probably the easiest just to maintain wise because white is just notorious for getting dirty. So hmm. it's not exactly the easiest color to have to wear for an entire day if you're, you're bowling. So I'm a fan of it. I like the new shirts. I like everything that they've done with that. It, it just looks much better now. And the fact that they're allowed to wear shorts too, I know that some people are a lot more comfortable wearing shorts than they are pants. So it's probably a, a good change all across the board. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. David saying in the chat, I like the change. The focus should be on the bulls, not on what people are wearing. You know, I can agree. Um, it's always nice to see teams wear similar things, but it shouldn't be. Yeah. Like mandated whites or mandated um, certain types. Like if you can, if you can match and you can do it stylishly and, and look good while you're playing and feel comfortable, which is the main thing. Um, that'd be awesome. Yeah. I could be wrong, but uh, I think I read somewhere or heard it when I was watching uh, Eric and Rob Gallopo's uh, Pairs game. I think they said something about uh, the color of the shoes potentially being a problem because Eric was wearing black shoes and if they weren't matching their partners, then it would be an issue. Interesting. I think I, 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 think I heard and I thought that was, was kind of... It could have been the, the shorts thing but i think it was shoes for some reason i'm not sure but i thought that was kind of interesting when i heard that i i do remember uh reading when i first got into bowls um here in canada and, and started to get into major competitions um even at, at, at that point having to be worried about socks like that was in the rules mm. if your socks didn't match your uh your partners like you wore black and he wore white um yeah like, Jeez, I mean, really? I don't know if it was the same for you guys, too, but just being the, the young guys on the scene, me and my brother always ran into problems with umpires telling us that we were out of uniform, whether it be because sock color or footwear color. It almost felt targeted, so it was kind of funny uh, kind of growing up in the sport. Yeah, no, I, I can't agree more, Luke. It's same thing here. Brother and me always ran into that problem where we were kind of criticized with the shoes or shirts that we'd select. Uh, for reading the chat right now, uh, Adam Randall, thanks for the like. He also indicated uh, the black trousers, white shirts. So like, essentially it's the umpire that 
kind of had the strict dress code uh, with them. So it's one of those things where, yeah, I, I don't see the point of really having a strict code where you're uh, having to wear or match exactly to the T, but having just like the same matching color bottoms and a matching shirt. That's pretty much all I think it is. And that's what they're going forward with. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, nice to see a quick change there. Um, so, uh, moving on from that. We do. Hold on, guys. Hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Sorry. With the uh, $7.99 Australian uh, super YouTube chat sticker thing. I don't know what it's called on YouTube. Uh, thanks very much for that, and we do appreciate it. Uh, I guess if you guys didn't know and you're curious what that is, uh, there is an option to uh, either have a highlighted chat message, I believe, called a super chat here on YouTube, or... Uh, donate with stickers as well for the chat. Um, obviously, that's not asked for, but always appreciate it if you choose to do so. Sorry, Mike, you, you might need to uh, to reiterate that. I made, I'm made i tinkering with some uh, technical uh, things back here. Uh, got a new PC for streaming um, because the old one was really screwing up, which was part of one of our major problems with uh, doing videos and stuff. So um, I actually muted you guys by accident <coughs> for a, a portion of that. I apologize. <laughs> um. Okay. Uh, so for getting back into it, we have an interview. Uh, if you didn't hear me last time. So Daryl and me interviewed Gary Willis, uh, head coach for the Jack Roos Australian national team. So we have an interview with him. Don't need to do much more of an intro because we kind of have one up there. So uh, let's go to that interview. I just want to throw a quick asterisk on before we go through. It is pre-recorded, so any questions that you have in the chat will not, unfortunately, be able to be answered by Gary today on the show. And uh, if you guys do hear an echo or something uh, that's causing an issue, please let us know in chat. Um, we'll do our best to, to try to fix all that stuff on the fly. Um, like I said, we're we're trying to make sure everything gets set uh, and, and ready to go. But uh, here comes the video. Uh, and Luke and Mikey, you'll need to mute yourselves for this one too. Thanks, guys. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Canadian Bowler. Uh, today here we have a special guest with us, uh, Gary Willis. Thanks for joining us here today. No problem, Mike. Thank you for having me. Uh, so first thing we're going to do here is we're just going to kind of throw it to you, let you kind of tell us for, I guess, the people on our show who may not know who you are, uh, just give us a little bit of information about who Gary Willis is and uh, how you relate to the Game of Bulls? Oh, thanks, Mike. So, um, uh, recently, or pro probably about six months ago, our, uh, our national coach, Steve Glasson, who... We're just going to pop out of that right now. Um, I'm going to try to fix that audio um, so we don't get an echo. I'm not exactly sure what's going on. Um, but we can move on and we can and pop back to that uh, interview video in, in a couple minutes. Um, Daryl, I don't know if you see my chat message there, but I think you had uh, two audio sources on the bottom that were both the exact same. But uh, anyways, yeah, let's have a quick chat. Uh, John, John Seitman's in the chat today. John, you haven't been here in forever. Where the heck have you been? We missed it here in the, in the Canadian Bowler. I guess we could also, uh, me and Mike, we can uh, spew some conversation here for a little bit. Uh, what do you think uh, your competition season looks for the upcoming season, Mike, 2022? Obviously, uh, the new year, we haven't uh, talked too much about that. Uh, like To my knowledge, Saskatchewan's planning to do sort of our normal nationals again. So, uh, bruh, I think my...
Okay, one sec. I told her, uh, yeah, like I, like I said, it's, uh, um, God. bear with us in the, in the new year. They're all okay. struggling today. Try now. Try now. In the new year. They're all struggling today. Try now. Now I'm getting an echo. Oh, baby. Who am I getting an echo through? I don't know, man. Sounds all right now. Does it sound all right now? Yeah. Okay. Um, let's try throwing to that video quick and uh, see if if anything is has been fixed. All right. Sorry for that, everybody. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Canadian Bowler. Uh, today here we have a special guest with us, uh, Gary Willis. Thanks for joining us here today. No problem, Mark. Thank you for having me. Uh, so first thing we're going to do here is we're just going to kind of throw it to you, let you kind of tell us for, I guess, the people on our show who may not know who you are. Uh, just give us a little bit of information about who Gary Willis is and uh, how you relate to the game of bowls. Well, thanks, Mark. So... Um... Uh, recently, or pro probably about six months ago, our, uh, our national coach, Steve Glasson, who uh, most people know pretty well in the in, in bowling circles, uh, a legend of our game, uh, particularly you know in Australia and and probably worldwide, having won world titles and and everything that basically is uh, uh, to win in bowls. So uh, Steve uh, moved on uh, around, like I said, six seven months ago, and and uh, take it up a, a role with uh, Bowling Club Insurance Brokers um, to uh, see out his retirement years, I guess. And uh, uh, he'd been in the role for, for 10 years previously as our national coach, and uh, the opportunity arose for, for me to step in uh, as being previously his, his national assistant coach for, for that uh, seven or eight year period prior. So, um, yeah, I, I was honoured to be offered the role. Um, obviously, you know, bowls has been a big part of my life. I started when I was 12, uh, so over 30 years in the game myself and, and was lucky enough to sort of play state bowls and play for Australia and Com Games and all that sort of stuff along the way. Um, but, um, yeah, sort of um, through an invitation from Steve, uh, probably, you know, close to 10, 12 years ago, I stepped into the coaching, uh, the coaching world, and and uh, began my, you know, my my career in coaching back then, and and it's evolved, uh, I, I suppose, rapidly. And um, I never thought I'd sort of be in a position or a role like this. It, it's um, it's been a steep learning curve for me, and I've loved every minute of it. And uh, I suppose you know, you with any sort of role, you you have to adapt, but particularly in coaching, I think it's. Um, you know, it's so important that you're able to adapt and, and uh, recognise uh, uh, how unique the role is um, because it's it's so different uh, from day to day and, and changes evolve so quickly. So, uh, yeah, so that's basically me in a nutshell. Here we are now. We've got a new team, a new high-performance team in Bowls Australia. Uh, we basically, you know, when, when Steve resigned, we, we started again from scratch and and just uh, build our team up. We've got some amazing people involved now, which I'm sure we'll touch on a little bit later. But um, that's how I've ended up where I am now, Mike. So hopefully that covers it well enough. I'll um, a few more highlights. Um, Two-time Coach of the Year, 2018 and 2020. Um, Jack Roo, uh, like you said, from 2000 to 2002. And uh, the BPL Coach of the Sydney Lions. Uh, a team I really like, by the way. So. <laughs> That's a bonus. Um, so really, uh, just to kick things off, what since you've taken over and um, and Steve's moves on, what has it been like for you to now have uh, the head coach job um, being an assistant for so long? Yeah, I think it's... Uh, well, well, it's... You know, probably a role that Steve and I sort of, you know, we, we shared and he sort of kept me... Totally across everything, and and I was involved in everything. So, the transition from a coaching perspective, uh, athlete to coach, probably hasn't changed that much. I suppose uh, through the national assistance role, it's it, it's quite funny, and I suppose it's different in every sport. 
Um, sometimes you can be a bit of a sounding board when they don't necessarily want to uh, share things with the national coach in, in fear of, um, you know, divulging too much of their personal life. So it's a funny sort of situation. Now I'm on the other side of the fence and, and you know, my national assistant coach, who's Karen Murphy, probably experiences the same uh, the, the same type of situation. So I think for me that the biggest, probably the, the, the biggest eye-opener has just been the back of house, uh, you, you know, negotiating with our, our you know, our stakeholders um, through government, through AIS, Australian Institute of Sport, CGA, Com Games Australia, um, and just, you, you know, the, the mountain of work that's involved behind the scenes. Um, we, we've, as I said earlier, we've, we've sort of started from scratch. Um, we've got a lot of new initiatives in place. We've got a far larger squad now than what we've ever had. So, We've gone some, from sort of, you know, uh, uh, 30, 30 plus to sort of 80, close to 80 squad members now throughout our, you know, our open jackaroos, emerging jackaroos, pathways jackaroos and our para jackaroos. So um, it's grown significantly and um, we've got a lot of new innovation and, and um, a lot of new uh, content within our program that, that certainly needs a lot of attention, back of house and organisation and, and and admin. So that's probably been the biggest part. Daryl is is just you know, um, I've had to jump off the deep end and get out of my comfort zone a little bit and get away from that uh, you know that on green connection and and what I've known for so long to to um, upskill in those areas for through administration and and that networking and 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 managing stakeholders. So which has been really good, you know. Um, uh, COVID's helped that situation. It's given me more time to actually create those relationships and engage, connect, uh, and also just get some ideas out there because when you're in, you, you know, you guys know as well as I do when it's an event after event after event in, in normal times. So you're sort of chasing your tail the whole time and it's really hard to um, get those new initiatives off the ground. It's It's even hard just to even have time to think through these new ideas when you've got all these events happening there's a lot going on so um, that time has been really beneficial and and uh, if anything good for us has come of COVID it's but it's been that just that back of house uh, new ideas new concepts coming through so yeah it's been very busy so you touched on something that I guess we wanted to ask it a little deeper about so with all those players and all the different I guess divisions in the 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 jackaroos how do you uh, end up managing so many players and so many uh, i guess different groups of people it's very interesting <laughs> it's uh no it, it, i'm i'm really lucky mike and we're lucky you know with bowls in australia we're well supported by the government well supported by australian institute of sport and and commonwealth games australia so uh with that comes significant investment and with that comes uh time and hours and employees that do a wonderful job um, and support me and and just, uh, you know, make the program what it is. Uh, as I said, it's evolved. We've got a new what we call a Pathways program now, which is an initiative from the uh, Australian Institute of Sport, uh, which means we have Pathways coaches in each state um, and, and, we've, and they sort of uh, deal with the daily training environments of our athletes coming through the system. So... Um, that you know they, they've got uh, a strong connection with all their you know their respective athletes. Uh, there's weekly reporting, weekly monitoring, um, and, and obviously they're, they're out there in the field. They're the front line that that um, you know are dealing with our uh, SDAs, uh, our state associations, uh, their their specific selection panels. Um, so it's like a scouting process. It's identifying new talent. And then it's it's getting them into the system, into our system, and and bringing them through, uh, and developing those players. So, yeah, I'm honestly I'm I'm really lucky and blessed with some of the people that we have involved. You know, we've got former state players, former Australian players, current Australian players in those roles um, that that do a wonderful job and are bringing our younger younger generation through. So, yeah, very lucky. Uh, talking about the um, the staff that you have. Um, I remember uh, my first couple stints at international coaching uh, were down in Broad Beach, um, managing uh, and coaching the four youth uh, that were playing in the youth championships. 
And I remember uh, seeing you. I didn't get to meet you there, but I do, I do remember seeing you as part of the, the large contingent of Australian coaches and support. <laughs> um, it blew me away. Uh, like every green had somebody there. Um, I think you were all mic'd up and, and talking to each other or talking to um, certain people. There was someone taking down information. Um, how does all that stuff get managed into um, being able to scout new players and find new talent and, um, I guess, get a consistent um, idea of what people are like? Yeah, I think it's a good question. And, and I think with bowls and, and um, you know, probably just a couple of things that stood out in the question were was around the amount of staff we have. And, and the you know, as I said, we're very lucky and very well supported. But um, we recently just put on our, our new high performance manager is Rebecca Van Ash, who you guys probably know is current Australian player. So it's quite a unique situation that we're in that, that Rebecca is still involved as a player uh, and will transition out into retirement uh, in the not too distant future and uh, take on that high performance manager's role, uh, you know, full on. But um, it, Rebecca, since she's been in the program, which is only sort of uh, uh, since July, uh, has said, I always wondered why we had so many staff and and wondered what they all did. And she said, now I just recognise that we haven't got enough. So <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was an interesting comment from Beck, uh, having been through recent trials. And as I said, you know, new innovation with our program, it's grown so much um, that we've recognised that, you, you know, the, um, the, the need and resources there. Um, the, the other comment that you made about us being mic'd up, um, I, th I think that, you know, we, we treat it, it's a professional role and we treat it as such and and we stay, you, you know, in communication with other with, with each other during matches. We ensure that our players are looked after first and foremost. We want to make sure that we don't leave any stone unturned to make sure that they can perform at their absolute best. Um, with, um, you know, statistics, stats, uh, statistical information, uh, that's that's really in its infancy, I guess. You know, we've probably looked at that over the last sort of, uh, you know, six or seven years, um, but had never really developed a, a program that allowed us to to really review the data that we were, you know, that, that we were gathering. And and now we're in a position where we have a, a, a voluntary stats man uh, by the name of Ken Polson that's developed a, a stats program from us. It's it's just absolutely amazing. And I think that's, you know, sort of way of the future with the game when you look at, you know, so many games, I, I you know, I just just to name a few, you know, sort of baseball and cricket and, and um, you know, your tennis and all that sort of stuff, all of that information, particularly with bowls, is just so important uh, to me. I, th I think, you know, uh, bowls historically, selection has always bugged me. I think that, you know, there's a lot of interpretation in the way that we used to do selection or carry out selection, and I think s stats just adds to that facts-based information where we can actually say in black and white, okay, this person is better for this green, better for this country, uh, better, you know, so we can w work out horses for courses, so to speak, and, and who is the best person to play at that location. Uh, and and as I say, it's it's early days. We've got so much more data to gather and we'll see the benefits of that years down the track, probably well after I'm gone. But, um, yeah, I think, we, we you know, with a, a talent ID process, Daryl, I, I think, you know, our pathways coaches within each state are very important. And then we've also got a, a long reach, you know, with uh, a lot of tentacles reach out. Uh, you look at the people that we've got involved, we've probably got over 100 years of international experience in our staff from the High Performance team. So over that 100 years, they've gathered a lot of connections, uh, a lot of people that they go to that are in the right places, whether it be state selectors, uh, whether it be just people that have played for you know, their state or, or Australia before that are still connected and they still watch these players and they still see them coming through at club land. So, you know, we use uh, various methods to, to talent ID and, and talent scout and bring these players through. So um, it's a big system and, and you're always being watched and we say that to players, you know, that you're always under scrutiny whether you think it or not. So, you know, we, we, we often say always bring your A game uh, if you want to play for Australia. So, yeah. 
Yeah, like you, you kind of touched on uh, another question that we had here. So, uh, your t- some countries are very, I guess, fresh to the whole analytics of bulls, uh, the sort of the coaching culture, working on creating like, better coaching programs. Australia, obviously, a little more on the develop line. When you, with all the <laughs> support you guys are talking about there, uh, so what are your feelings about uh, coaching culture across uh, Australia? Yeah, I think we've. I think we've got a lot of work to do. You know, I think we, we've, um, like you say, I think coaching culture in bowls is, is um, it's sort of sitting right on the fence for me. I think, you, you know, we sort of haven't sort of delved right into exactly what it means, exactly what those roles entail. I think from a from a grassroots coaching perspective, I think we've got a long way to go in Australia. I think that, you know, we're just starting to scratch the surface with that as well. And, and I've these roles are so important, you know, uh, particularly when you look at participation, um, inclusion and, and bringing new people into the sport. The coach generally in Australia is the first person that you get directed to in a club. So that person and, and, and the impact that they create uh, with that relationship, somebody new to the game coming into that club for the first time is so important, you know. So you're either going to have a really good experience with a really good coach uh, and someone that embraces you and supports you through that initial process, or, or you're going to have somebody that you know is is a little bit borderline, and potentially we could lose that member. You know, so and I think that member retention it's so important. The coach's role is so important um, to retain that membership. They keep the people, you know, they keep them motivated. They keep them wanting to come back. They keep them wanting more. So. Um, I, yeah, I think, you know, we've got so much work to do in that space. Uh, I think that we've got a lot of good people out there um, that, that could be really good at it and probably, like me, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, uh, didn't even think about it, you know, a- until I was approached and, and you say, okay, actually, I do like this, you know. So I think we need the structure and, and the formats in place that um, uh, we can identify these people uh, and bring them into the system and have a structure in place that they can go through that process and become really good coaches because there's a lot of great people out there. So uh, a lot of work to do in that space, I think. I couldn't have said it better myself. The, um, being here in Canada, it's, it's kind of the same thing. Um, the, the struggle to get really good grassroots coaching um, and get the people just on the pathway, um, let alone yeah. down the pathway, is, is the toughest part. Absolutely. Yep. Um, so obviously, um, COVID has had a, a huge effect on uh, bulls around the world, um, and especially in Australia, um, we've seen um, you know openings and lockdowns, and some states are are doing quite well, and some states um, have been in lockdown over and over and over again. Um, with all these cancellations, events being postponed, um, nothing really internationally happening. Um, how has this had an effect on um, the players that you're coaching and and trying to get them ready to come back in uh, 2022? Yeah, it's been really tough, Daryl. Uh, tough for everybody, uh, you know, obviously across the world. Um, for bowls specifically, uh, uh, and the way that it's probably affected us most is that cross-border travel, you know. So all of our states uh, uh, can't get their act together and they're not aligned, so it creates issues uh, not just for people trying to get into a specific state to hold a trial where we normally have all states come together and then we trial or have a camp together. Um, yeah, so not only the people that are trying to get into that state, but when they return home and then, you know, isolation for 14 days, all this type of stuff, it just makes it totally unviable for us. And, you know, we're not, uh, our, our athletes aren't, professionals by any means you know they, they've still got jobs they've still got bills to pay so we can't you know put that in that put them in that position to to have to isolate for 14 days and, and have no income so uh, it's been tough it's been really tough and I, I you know I really feel for the players it's a it's a fine line too because you want to create and provide as much opportunity as you can um, but in the same breath you don't want to push it too hard uh, where people are, are suffering, you know, so they're, they're going through a lot at home and, and you know, we, we can put all these, uh, you know, training in place and, and um, we can put ideas on the table for, for future camps. 
um, but then you're making promises you can't keep as well. So it's a really, it's a really fine line. It's been really tough. We've done everything out we possibly can uh, whilst keeping the, you, you know, the um, the well-being of the of our athletes in mind, or first and foremost in mind. So. Um, but we had looked at and we have success, successfully just c- carried out a para trial. So uh, we, we actually, with the current restrictions, we could send uh, four states into Tasmania to trial and then two states into Victoria to trial, um, which isn't ideal, you know. So, uh, uh, you, you know, but we wanted to give them at least an opportunity. We've got a pretty new squad with our para team and we just wanted to have an initial look uh, and get them... Uh, a little give them a little feel for what it's like to be in a jackaroos camp and what how that system works how the whole selection process works so it actually um it's a, as i say it's the first time we've ever had to do it a split camp uh and it actually worked really well so um we had you know with the benefit of live feed uh we had some uh some private channels set up where our selectors that couldn't make it to those venues could sit back we could stat games uh, through that live feed, they could visual, you know, they could visually see and hear what was going on, what the, you know, what the combinations were working like, what the, you know, the audio that was coming through, what the communication was like. So, uh, for the best we could do, it actually worked quite well, you know. So um, I hope we don't have to do it again. But uh, <laughs> you, you know, we know that we've got a little uh, test uh, program there that worked okay, you know. So. Yeah, but it has been difficult. You know, we've uh, we've probably postponed five camps uh, since ju- wow. June. Uh, that that was preparation or, or marked out as preparation for our Birmingham campaign, uh, which is tough. You know, and, and then you you've got things like our Australian Open, some of our uh, benchmark events that um, the players can actually compete in and put their best foot forward for for those selections. Now, you know. Uh, uh, some of our states couldn't compete in that. Others could, you know. So, so that just sort of leaves that doubt in our in our players' minds of, you know, well, where does that leave me, you know? And and um, you know, from our perspective, we've just got to keep an open mind. And and from a selection perspective, we've got to keep that in mind, you know, that that they've had uh, they haven't had equal opportunity. Um, but one thing we have done, Daryl and Mike, is that we've. We've actually uh, been really lucky with Bowls New Zealand and and uh, potentially Bowls Fiji uh, and uh, our friends over in the UK. So um, Bowls Scotland, Bowls Ireland, and and Bowls England, Bowls Wales. Um, that we're hoping to have a, a few internationals in the new year, um, where we'll take ten players, ten male, ten female. So we're going to utilise our whole squad. Um, of open jackaroos to trial so we can provide them with that opportunity because we just haven't been able to we haven't been able to see them you know we haven't been able to test them they haven't had the opportunity of playing an international event we'll probably have uh, two or three players that will be newly capped um, and, and that could be potentially their first international event right. yet, yet you know um, that they'll even get a glimpse of they haven't had a taste of that before so um, yeah, so that, that's one thing that we're trying to do, and we've been really lucky and su- uh, well supported from the other countries. So, uh, really appreciative of that. That's uh, pretty much one of the the questions we were going to eventually <laughs> get to was we we oh, sort, we'd sort of we sort of figured that um, with the lack of competitions that have occurred that it would probably be a pretty difficult situation to to pick a player or how to sort of come to why you're going to select this person over another person. So if you guys are arranging international events or sort of test matches, that's, that's obviously one of the ways you can get around that. And if the restrictions sort of do ease up or hopefully sort of come to a new normal, it, it hopefully will be something that you guys can sort of take advantage of in the next few months here. Absolutely. Yeah. We've, we, we've, we've got a camp at the end of uh, January where uh, we'll have, it's it's called our induction camp so we'll have sort of you know close to 80 80 athletes and and uh additional staff come in for camp and and, and obviously we go through uh, the program and and uh, there's a lot of stuff indoors for the first few days and then we move out to an outdoor trial 
um, which will include uh, our Open Jackaroos, so 20 players from our Open Jackaroos and 20 players from our Emerging and Pathways Jackaroos that will play against our Open Jackaroos. So that'll be a great opportunity for our, our younger players and also our Open Jackaroos to um get their first trial hopefully in preparation for Birmingham and and obviously the first you know selection uh, component of our uh, of our campaign it, there's a lot of results too I guess that you know we've taken into account we, we've seen players play together before we've seen how they combine we know them quite well um, uh, and other results are taken into consideration the, the the other problem that we've got is obviously that you know Australian based results, don't really come into the equation for UK, you know. So our greens, as you guys know, uh, are totally different to the UK and it's a different style of play. So um, that's something that we've worked really hard on behind the scenes is just getting that, uh, you know, that mental approach in their training at home. So we've identified greens in, you know, for all of our players that they can go and train on and start to get used to uh, the change in the style of play from what they normally play in Australia. Uh, and, and just the physicality of that, I guess, you know, you change your technique. Um, greens in Australia uh, uh, run a lot quicker than they do in the UK. And, and you know, you, whether it be, you know, you're more upright in your stance, your step's a bit longer, you know, all the levers are working uh, over time and you're using muscles that you don't normally use. So uh, in their training, it's just identifying and, and making notes around, okay, what works, you know, when I time one really well, what, you, you know, what did I do that contributed to that and write some notes so when they go back to that training phase again um, that they're straight on to what worked previously. It, it's a fine line too because we've got it, we've actually got a, a domestic season running at the same time as they're trying to prepare for a green that's totally foreign. So um, they've got club championships, they've got pennants, they've got Premier League, they've got all this stuff happening domestically and then we throw them out at the end of January on a green running 10 seconds to say, come and have a trial for Australia, you know. So it's, it's really hard for, for those guys and, and uh, we're trying to manage that the best we can uh, and they're doing a really good job of it, you know. So um, we, we've just got a, a, a support from, from our, you know, our manufacturers locally here in Australia. Uh, you guys have probably heard see, uh, Commonwealth Games, at red and blue bowls. So that's been another little... Uh, another little uh, spanner in the works, so to speak, that they've had to change their bowls and start adapting to the to the wider sets and, and new sets, you know. So uh, red and blue, which is a great, you know, it's, it's a great um, concept from, from Com Games and, and uh, will be a great visual for the, for the games too. So, uh, yeah, all these little things that just get thrown in there and, and we've had to adapt to and our players have had to adapt to. It's, um, it's interesting, but uh, keeps us on our toes, that's for sure. Uh, talking about red and uh, blue bulls, uh, we we just went through an interview with um, your assistant coach Karen Murphy, and she brought up the the red and blue bulls as well. And um, wanted to ask you a question about it. Um, what do you what do you think of the concept? Obviously, um, um, I think from a marketing standpoint, it it makes a lot of sense. Um, does it throw off players at all um, having a, a new set? Um, I mean, the mental game is such a, a critical part of bowls. Um, picking up a new set, not your color, not your bowl. Um, does that really, uh, do you see that have an effect on players? Absolutely. Yeah, I do. Sorry, that's my phone. <laughs> um, absolutely, I do. I, um, you know, I, I think some players are superstitious. They, they've got their favorite sets of bowls and, and they feel, you know, it's, uh, you, you know, you you play with a bowl for, for, you know, a number of games or a number of years and they, they just feel right in your hand and, and you get so used to it and, and it becomes an automatic. So um, we've, as I said before, we've been really lucky in our dealings with manufacturers from Henselite, uh, Drake's Pride, uh, Aero and Thomas Taylor that they've um, they, they've fast-tracked those red and blue bowls to our squad members and, and uh, we're actually training with them now. So... Um, They'll they'll get a lead in a good lead in and hopefully they get comfortable with those sets. Um, the, the the biggest problem for us is uh, you, you look at you look at the models the makes and models. So um, we actually wanted our players to take two or three sets to the UK um, in preparation. So we've got a uh, we've uh, got a potential UK tour in May uh, for a couple of weeks over there. 
So we wanted them to try two or three different models um, on the greens just to see which ones they were most comfortable with. So for the manufacturer to provide two or three different models, you know, you, you're talking a squad of 20 and you times that by six sets of bowls per player because it's red and blue as well as two or three different models, well, it's a significant contribution, you know. So whether they be a sponsored player or whether, the, you know, the player's got to purchase these bowls, it's a huge impact. Yeah. Uh, and then you turn around um, and and we're going to do the same thing for potentially for World Bowls in 2023. Uh, and then you go back to the other models, you know, the models that they normally use in Australia. Well, there's another, you know, there's a, there's another couple of sets for red and blue. So, yeah, I, I mean, for me, anything that anything that creates interest in the game, anything that promotes the game, uh, let's do it. You know, uh, the Commonwealth Games is, is our biggest stage. It, that, that's our Olympics, you know. That's as good as it gets for us. That's the biggest way for us to promote our game through through the world, you know, throughout the world. So whatever we have to do, whatever we have to do with formats, whatever we have to do to make that, uh, uh, you, you know, appeal more uh, or, or more appealing just in general, just to promote our game, let's do it. Let's have a, let's have a look at it. And, and that's coming from me, you know, 30 plus years in the game. And I'm a traditionalist. I love the <laughs> old formats of the game, you know, so it kills me in a way to say that, but I also recognise the fact of, of how big the Commonwealth Games is for us and, and the promotion of our sport. So, um, you know, if it's easier for a viewer, someone new to the game to sit there at red and blue bowls, they know exactly what's happening. They know who's got the shot uh, or, or what they have to do to get the shot. Um, uh, let's do it. it. Makes the game clearer to them, makes it more appealing. Um, let's jump on board. It's the same with formats. You know, um, we've got to adapt uh, as a sport. And um, whatever gets those viewers uh, turning their channels on to our sport and, and turning that into numbers in members, you know, throughout the countries, I think that's the most important thing. So. Yeah, no, I, I think the, the colour switch is a brilliant uh, idea to just make it across the board. Uh, Daryl and me had discussed potentially the... I guess color coding it for the countries and sort of having them match the country's colors. But then I think we came into a conclusion that it'd be hard with a couple of the countries that have very similar color schemes. So I think the red and blue is probably about as good an idea as you can get, just have the two sets and have them available. Um, like, I guess the Commonwealth games is right around the corner here. So one of the biggest or debatably the biggest event in the bulls calendar every uh, four years there. So Australia at the last Commonwealth Games was the most successful team uh, in the tournament, had very good results in Australia there. Uh, being the head coach for Team Australia at this point, is there some sort of uh, added pressure or any sort of additional pressure, I guess, on you guys as the coaching staff for preparing and being ready and getting that team ready for this Commonwealth Games coming up? Well, not until you just mentioned it, Mike. Thanks for that. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, yeah, it's it's obviously in my mind. And, and I think, you know, uh, my old mate, Steve Glasson, he, he couldn't have less, left at a worse time. So he left us in the middle of COVID and in the middle of, middle of the hardest campaign that we've got, which is travelling to the UK. Um, you know, we're very mindful that we've never actually won a med we, We've never won a gold medal in the UK uh, at a Commonwealth Games. So... Um, that, that's right in my mind, you know, that uh, we have to work really hard. We have to work 10 times harder than we normally do. Um, history shows that we're nowhere near as good in the UK as what we are at home in Australia or in New Zealand. Uh, and, and we've got to put the work in. Otherwise, we'll come away with nothing again, you know. So, um, and, and obviously, COVID has impacted that, but we can make all the excuses we want at the end of the day. We can still train at home. We can still get used to the pace. Um, we can still get used to the pace. The thing is we just need we, we need more of that uh, match play and that style of play, just getting used to that style of play in our preparation. So, um, yeah, that, it's definitely front of mind, Mike, and, and um, it, it's going to be tough. You know, those guys are so good over there. But it's, it's just similar to what we are over, you know, on our, our home patch. We're used to it. That's our automatic it, it, it's, um, you know, I think Australian style of play is that our players are, are used to being millimetre perfect. Um, 
they can correct over here, whereas over there it's a different style. So you, you don't necessarily or you can't necessarily correct within millimetres in the UK. It's more of, of consistency and finishing in good areas and, and uh, minimising wasted bowls, which is hard for us because and hard for anyone that's not used to that type of green because you you always go back to your automatic and as soon as your concentration fades uh, and you go back to that automatic, well, you can just count that bowl out. That That's not going to work, you know. So, um, yeah, very tough but really looking forward to the challenge, you know. Um, uh, I played com games in Manchester uh, and it was absolutely terrible. In 2002, we played in the rain for two weeks and... Uh, I was horrendous, and uh, our, our team uh, wasn't too much better. But uh, it was an eye opener, and and you know I played quite a bit in the UK and South Africa, and and on those greens uh, that that uh, aren't similar to ours. And and you know I, I sort of, I know what it's all about. I, I know what is needed, um, but we just need to uh, get our players in that in that mindset. We've got great experience. You know, we look at the people that we've got involved now. We've got. Andy Thompson is our tac tactical coach from the UK. We've got Ellen Faulkner on board now, who's our uh, high-performance para manager, um, and obviously Karen Murphy, Rebecca Van Ash, who who have played in those environments before and been successful in those environments. So I think for us, the biggest takeout was probably our multi-nations tour in Wales in, uh, I think it was 2018 or 19, and um, we, we actually had some success over there. Um, but I just sort of keep keep that in check a little bit too because they're in the middle of a of a massive drought. We went over there and it was like 27, 28 degrees and the greens were probably running about 14. So it's a bit of a false truth to think that we were, you know, that successful. But, um, yeah, we won a few medals, which was good. And, and um, you know, it, it proves that we can do it uh, when we travel over there. Um, we just need to work really hard at changing that style of play. Yeah, I was actually part of uh, Team Canada over when you guys were over in Wales. So I, I remember, I think the, a couple of the people made comments to us that they've never had a week of sunshine in a row for <laughs> for like 20 plus years. And I think they had 10 or 11 straight days of sunlight when we were there. So it was a lot quicker. And we came with our North American bowls when we could have came with our slightly narrower biases. So yeah, uh, it was beautiful. It, was, yeah. it, it was great. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you talked a lot about uh, a little bit about um, preparing for for the Northern Hemisphere greens. Obviously, UK players, um, can Canadian players, um, are used to that style of play. Are used to the greens that, unlike in Australia, where it's um, it's quicker and it's truer. So, I mean, you could put a, a string down and it would be level all the way down. Uh, if you put one in the UK or whatever, you'd see, you know. The string is very close at one end, and it gets a little higher, and then a little lower, and a little higher. So you've got hills and runs, and and a whole bunch of weird stuff. Um, how do you think that's going to affect your players? And are there any specific things that you're doing to prepare them for um, not just the speed, but just the um, the unpredictability of greens? Yeah, I think it's all in that that mental approach, Daryl. You know, and just getting your head around. Um, that you can't be perfect all the time on those greens. The greens just don't allow it. And um, I think that that's the toughest thing for our guys is that they're used to correcting. Um, and, and sometimes you've just got to be happy with good enough is good enough or that's as good as it's going to get, you know. So, um, and, and it's really hard to, I suppose, change that mindset. But, you know, we keep talking about it. We've, we have um, uh, obviously master classes where we we go through different scenarios we talk about that surface we talk about you know what it can do with you with the little hills and valleys and what that can do to you your self-belief uh, and your positivity you know so i think um you guys know as good as anyone body language and positivity in bowls uh, that positive mindset is key you know your mental approach uh, and your confidence is paramount to you being successful so I think that, you know, we just got to get through uh, and break that cycle, okay? Um, it's not necessarily going to be perfect. I'm happy to win or happy to get as close as I can, uh, whether it be pretty or ugly, you know? Uh, let's just uh, play it as it is. And and uh, I, I think the other key is, too, just really jumping onto those cues and clues uh, quickly, you know, identifying what the variance is, is in the rink 
uh, and and you guys know better than us that you, you, you know you get on those greens and the and the rinks it's not changes from green to green it's actually changes from rink to rink um, <laughs> yeah. so they can be totally do you can jump off you can play the AM game in the morning and and say geez I can't wait to get off this rink and get on another one and the next rink can be on the same green and be worse you know so <laughs> it's a it's a uh, a tough mindset for us to get through because we're probably spoiled guys like we we you know we're We've got clubs that are that are very financial. They've got professional greenkeepers, and and they maintain the greens to a high standard. So, you know, we're we're spoilt for uh, for good greens, and as you say, level greens. So, um, and, and it's again, it's that style of play. We, you know, it's it's draw. You know, you draw really well in Australia. Your first two bowls, whoever can jump on it, put the pressure on first. That's what it's all about. And then they've our players have got really good, you know, hits. They've got a really good drive, you know, so their strike rates are really good. Um, whereas when you play on the on the slower stuff, it's more keeping bowls in the area. Bowls and jacks don't move. Uh, I feel like I'm preaching to the converted here, but <laughs> the bowls and jacks don't move. You know, like we can play the big shot, and, and you know, you get three rolls out of a bowl. You know, whereas in Australia, you you can play the big shot and scatter ahead, like totally change the game or change that end. Whereas over there, you know, the, the, the jack doesn't react the same, the bowls don't react the same, and and um, it's not as impactful, I guess. So, um, yeah, yeah, something for us to consider again. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think there's quite a few shots in the North American playbook that aren't very common in the Australian playbook. So <laughs> it sounds, sounds like you guys have sort of attributed to that and work been working on it because as you're saying sometimes you can play a sort of just a through weight and knock a ball out a roll or two instead of having to play the big drive so uh definitely obviously something that's you need to prepare for if you're coming over to a bit of a slower green yeah um so one of the topics we wanted to sort of get into is with commonwealth games uh this like potentially could be one of them that's sort of in the present format so there's been talks about the commonwealth games changing uh, potentially being removed even from it um, sort of there's all over the place conversation wise so how, what do you feel that the Commonwealth Games means to lawn bowling? Yeah probably touched on it a little bit before there Mike just it's it's there's no bigger promotion for our sport um, you know worldwide audience uh, uh, it's our opportunity to show what our sport's all about and um, to me, you, you know, from a lesser extent, uh, from a player's perspective, growing up as a kid, I couldn't wait to get the coat of arms. We used to have a blazer. So I'm really old, fella, sorry. But <laughs> we used to have a blazer and it used to have a coat of arms on it. And and my coach or mentor or whatever you want to call him at the time actually played com games. And um, I saw him, you know, and I saw the pictures and I saw his blazer and I saw this coat of arms, this Australian coat of arms. I thought I really want to get one of those jackets. Uh, unfortunately for me, when I finally got it, they changed the coat of arms to the BA logo and uh, that nearly killed me, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it, was, it was great to receive that and, and, you know, still pinch myself that I actually got, got that far in the sport. But, I, you know, I think for any player coming through, you want to play com games, you know. You, you think of the live crowds. You guys saw, you know, 2018, the, the crowds at the Gold Coast, that atmosphere, that you know, the the TV, the big lights, the big show, it doesn't get any better than that. And um, I think, from as I say, from a, a higher level and for the sport, I, I just think we have to do everything we can do uh, to make that appealing to to the worldwide community. You know, so we have to come up with a format. I know that World Bowls are working pretty hard at the moment. They've formed a committee to to look at that, to look at, um, you know, what it looks like for us moving forward after or post-22 um, and probably will turn around as quickly as 2026 as far as formats are concerned. Um, that's just my thoughts. I, th I think they have to do that, you know. So, um, that, mate, I, as I said, I'm traditionalist. It's killing me. I, I want to see the old formats, but uh, realistically, if we want to move forward as a sport and we want to stay engaged as a Commonwealth Games sport, um, we have to move with the times and we have to attract more people to the sport. There's still going to be space for, um, you know, the traditional formats. Um, you know, go back to, to club level, you look at your pennants, you look at club championships. Um, 
you know, that might change over time too, you know, if we get a good enough format in place and um, people have changed, uh, people are time poor, they want, to, uh, they want to get involved in everything and have a taste of everything, which is great. If we can just grab a little bit of that market and we do that through the biggest leverage we've got, which is Com Games, well, bring it on, you know. Let's, uh, let's be accepting and adapt and, and do what we've got to do to attract more people to the sport. Uh, I think you said it really well. Um, I'm, I'm big on the traditional game as well. I, I can sit there and watch games and be totally enthralled and and um, and not have a problem. Um, I think there's a lot of hardcore fans that um, you know throw bowls at them and they'll watch it regardless. It's that casual market, the the people that aren't sure or have never seen the game, um, that probably don't want to sit through a two to three hour game of singles or fours and not really know what's going on. Um, so, like you said, just um, everybody being open uh, to change, open to trying to support our, our sport and, and get it um, out there for everybody to see is going to be a, a huge deal. Yeah, absolutely, totally agree. So, uh, um, my final question for you, um, you threw out some names um, of, your, of your current staff. You know, you've got Andy Thompson, legend. Uh, you've got Ellen Faulkner, who's uh, arguably uh, one of the best uh, female bowlers out of England and was a huge anchor for their team. Um, and now you've got um, Karen Murphy on there. And I, w I wanted to touch on that. For you, what does it mean to have, um, you know, one of the best female bowlers um, Australia has had, um, someone who's had such a long career and a decorated career, um, come onto your staff and um, be your assistant coach? Yeah, I you know I often sit in meetings and 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 look around the you know look around the room or look around the screen and and just think wow like this is just the it's the absolute who's who of bowls you know it's it's and and as I said you know the the history and the knowledge and the experience uh, it's just second to none and and it's it's great the, the the greatest thing though fellas is that they're good people. They're just really genuinely good people, and that's that's all we want in our program, you know. So if we get good people in our program, success is going to come. Success will follow, you know. So um, it, it's one of our policies that we're only going to have good people. I won't tell exactly what that policy is because there's there's a little sort of swear word in there, but um, <laughs> uh, yeah, we we really want to work with good people and and want to have good people involved with our program. Uh, you talk about Andy Thompson, you talk about Ellen Faulkner, you talk about uh, Rebecca Van Ash uh, and Karen Murphy. Well, they don't get much better than that, you know. So um, they're, they're, they're highly, uh, uh, they're, they're, they're very uh, uh, highly driven by their values. Uh, they've got great culture. They're, they're just everything you could hope for uh, in a staff member. Uh, but then when you throw in their bowls experience and expertise, well, it doesn't get much better. So absolutely blessed and then you know we've got you know t uh, Rebecca Van Ash as well so you know Beck's current world and and uh, Commonwealth champion yeah. uh, and, and then we've got uh, expertise through our high performance operations manager Leah Lazaro and also our athlete well-being manager who's Sammy Cox and uh, yeah you know those people bring just as much uh, in their areas of expertise as do our former, you know, former and current uh, players uh, in our staff. So we've got a really good group at the moment. And we're working really hard, not just to, not just to work on the elite. We're really working hard in that coaching grassroots space and, and the participation, para sport, um, and attracting people to the sport. You know, bringing them into our pathway. Um, and you know, the end goal is obviously that they get up there and they play for Australia. They come into our program, but. We know that starts somewhere and we know that we've got to get involved further down through the system. And I just think we've got brilliant people involved, you know, um, to do that. Uh, Karen's a, a prime example and and uh, she I couldn't have asked for a better assistant coach, uh, to, to be honest, with her support, her, the respect, you know, throughout the uh, throughout the world in the bowls. Uh, uh, the bowls fraternity is just second to none. Um, you know, she's taught everybody a great deal about how to manage stakeholders and 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 how to connect with people and and just networking i, I don't think there's anyone better at it than uh, what kaz is and, and she's taught all of us ellen faulkner and i were only talking about this the other night um that you know we remember 
back in our younger days watching Karen sort of walk through a room and work a room and just talk with people because she just loves it. She loves talking the game. She loves talking with people and, and people love her, you know, and, and um, we're very fortunate. So she actually is the manager. Kaz is the manager of our Pathways program as well. Um, so, so she's making those connections out in the broader system and, and bringing those kids through. So I think of, you know, our young junior girls coming in uh, for the first time and the first person they meet is Karen. Well, it doesn't get much better than that, you know, because she's been there, done it all. She started when she was 11. She's seen the whole system. I remember, Kaz, we, we've known each other since I think I was I was 12 and she was 11. And um, I know we might have been a bit... Uh, might have been a little bit older than that, probably 12 and 13. But um, I remember Kaz having to go through that process uh, with women's bowls where she had to stand in a box and they'd measure measure the length of a skirt. Yep. Uh, she had to wear the, the right colour stocking. So I remember it was a mini beige stocking she had to wear and she had to wear this awful hat, <laughs> this terrible hat. And I used to think, how the hell is this girl going to last in this sport, having to go through these, jump through these hoops? And um, she did. She persisted. You know, she's been, you know, obviously Australia's best uh, by a country mile and uh, if not, you know, the world's best. And uh, she's resilient. She's tough. And, and uh, she's a good person. And uh, she, we're, we're very lucky. We've got a great team. And, um, you know, we're, we're going to work as hard as we can for, for the sport uh, as well as the elite. So, yeah. Yeah, very exciting times. I guess that that's about all we we had arranged here for today. So uh, we we really do appreciate you coming on the show, uh, giving us the uh, the Australian perspective on Commonwealth Games coaching, everything like that. It's it's been great. Um, and I guess that's if that's all we've got here. We'll wish you a good day, and thanks for coming out. No, that's fantastic, fellas. Well, I, I haven't asked about you guys. So, what's the process for you guys now? What are you uh, uh, with Canada? Have you established a squad, or what, what's the situation? Uh, not yet. Um, not yet. We're we're yeah. in the same situation. I, I heard a lot of common themes uh, from what you were saying, where it's you know lack of competition. What do you, what do you judge a player on? It's been two years since maybe we last saw them compete in two thousand nineteen. Um, how do you weigh one person to another uh, based on that? We've got players in Australia like Ryan and Kelly and Leanne uh, versus people in Canada who um, were locked down and are now um, the greens are covered in ice and snow, so they don't have a chance to get out there. Um, we, we have a lot of those questions um, being worked at, like when can we do training camps? When can we do um, some match play stuff? Uh, find ways to give them an opportunity to compete, uh, show their stuff, show what they've been doing. Um, and like you said, you know, come up with their A game, wow us and say, this is why I deserve um, to be picked for this team. And then uh, it'll be sometime next year that we'll, we'll finally make selection and, uh, and announce that team. But yeah, it's, we're in the same position, just a uh, different climate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, thinking of you guys and all the very best with it, and uh, I really appreciate you letting me come on and have a chat with you. It's good to see you both and, and uh, hopefully see you uh, uh, in about six months' time. I hope so, yeah. All right. Uh, thanks. Uh, Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Um, all that. And uh, thanks for coming on. Same to you guys. Take care. Ladies and gentlemen, Great interview with uh, Gary Willis, head coach of uh, Bulls Australia. Uh, took over for Steve Glass, and I hope you really enjoyed that interview. It was a long one, we we do realize, um, but there were so many great questions. He gave so many great answers. Um, just can't uh, thank him enough for coming on. Yeah, thanks. Uh, if you're out there listening, Gary, obviously I wasn't able to be a part of the interview there, but uh, we do appreciate you coming on, so thank you very much for that. I wanted to make just one comment on the end there. He was talking about Karen Murphy going through that phase of uh, really awful dress code checks, and we were talking about dress code before. Um, one, I, I didn't give a shout-out to her uh, during her interview on the last show, but um, give a shout-out to her now. She's actually coming out, uh, came out with a, a line of women's uh, bowls clothes. Oh, I didn't uh, realize that. Yeah, oh, that she's doing, you. and um, uh, I think that's wonderful, considering she went through probably the worst uh, point of getting her 
skirt measured, wearing big hats, all that kind of stuff. And uh, now she's coming out with a, a line that's dedicated to making women's bowls um, more athletic and stylish and um, in with the times, let's say. <laughs> awesome. Well, I think that's about all we had uh, planned here for today. Just sort of the normal, uh, I guess, pumping up of our future videos. We've got more interviews coming up. Uh, we have a few other ones that we've taped at this point. So uh, you'll be seeing more interviews down the line here. Uh, so keep keep your eye on, uh, open for those next ones coming up in our future shows. Uh, there, there are definitely some good interviews coming up. So not something you'll want to miss. Alrighty, guys, I guess it's come to that time where it's my time to uh, steal the floor from the boys here. So, Mike, you shut your mouth. Uh, if you guys didn't during the case of the course of the show, remember always like, comment, subscribe. We appreciate all that. I did forget to mention at the start of the show. So if you did miss any of the show, don't forget we're available on all major podcast platforms, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify as the major ones out there. Um, so if you want to watch any of the show, it'll be posted on there within a few days. And the video also goes live on YouTube within the hour after the show. So you can watch the, the video. So for your viewing, listening, and whatever pleasures you need from the Canadian Bowler, we're available wherever you need us. Um, and I guess that's it. I guess we'll be back probably in two weeks' time. I don't know if we have anything coming out before then or not. If not, I guess it's a surprise. So you better hit that notification bell down below <laughs> just in case so you get the notification if anything gets posted on our video. Uh, thanks, Daryl Mike, for showing up today. Thanks again for Gary for that interview. It was great. And uh, everyone in the chat today, thank you very much. And uh, I guess until next time, guys, hope all your bowls are touchers. <laughs>